Ruth Safar is Associate Professor of Comparative yep. Literature and Women's Studies yes. and yes. Faculty. Sorry, Ruthie, did you have something to say? Not Associate Professor. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's important. She is, apologies, Professor of Comparative Literature and Women's Studies and Faculty Associated at the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She is the author of Life in Citations, Biblical Narratives and Contemporary Hebrew Culture, and the author of Stains of Culture and Ethno Reading of Karaite Jewish Women. Professor Tsofar, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Good morning. It's wonderful to see all these faces and names. I'm going to share my screen so you'll know. You'll have more visual for what I'm talking about. Um, wait. So. Oh, no, this one. Um, I put it on presenter view. I'm sitting in front of a big window and it's sunny, so it's wonderful. And actually, I'm sorry, I need to go back to the sharing screen. Mm. My, my computer got stuck. So. Oh. Okay, and I'll do the show screen. I think as we wait for uh, Professor Tsofar, we, if you would put into the chat, what are you interested in knowing about women in the Hebrew Bible? What comes up for you? What, what are you interested in learning? That would be great to share with one another, our uh, excitement. Oh, okay. Um, so I've been teaching and researching women in the Bible I can say that I was exposed to women in the Bible from a very, very young age as a kid and being fascinated by it as an Israeli who um, grew up with a, a Hebrew. It was very much part of our uh, uh, growing up uh, to, um, to study the Bible, to identify with the Bible. My name is biblical. Um, Israeli life is very much very paved with every biblical, many biblical references uh, uh, in, in daily life, in the calendar, in um, the symbolic and uh, uh, language, metaphoric, mythological, that it's hard not to be um, aware of uh, biblical narratives. However, when we come to study women in the Bible, uh, we have a new challenge. So I, I ask the big question for me is how do we join the community of women in the Bible to assume that there is a community, to assume that we enter into a new space that requires special reading as a feminist. So and how we join the community, our community, the virtual workshop, 
reading or scholarly workshop or classroom workshop, any a community of readers and scholars of women in gender study, comparative literature, and Judaic studies. So this is your son should watch this. <coughs> it's women in the Hebrew. What's happening, Grima? I think if everyone could make sure to mute their um, cameras, I oh. mean their mics, and turn off their cameras so that we don't have double voicing happening. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Professor Safar. So the big cha challenge is what else, what do we need in order to get into the new community? What, and what do I mean by that? So, um, and, and I don't, for some reason, just bear with me a second, this will, um, become easier. For some reason, I don't have the cursor. Okay. So I'm 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 going to use a Jacques Derrida a quote. He's a male, but he's totally feminist in many ways and a major scholar of a philosopher. And I like his question. So how do we talk? How to talk religion? How dare we speak of it in a singular without fear and trembling this very day? And so briefly and so quickly, who would be so imprudent as to claim that the issue here is both identifiable and new? So how do we come to the Bible? How do we come to reading it? What, what is, and what does it mean to come without fear and trembling in, uh, in, in our own reality? Should we come with fear? So Derrida's approach is very similar to my approach and the approach that we in comparative literature and in women's studies take. To give oneself the necessary courage, arrogance and serenity, therefore perhaps one must pretend for an instant uh, to abstract, to abstract from everything or almost everything in a certain way perhaps one must take one's chance in restoring to the most concrete and most accessible, but also the most barren and desert-like of all abstractions. So abstract, to abstract is to go to the, to the lowest, uh, uh, bare, most bare uh, 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 performance of language and to try to deconstruct and to uh, look at the most uh, uh, detailed aspect of language from roots to uh, etymologies to, and how meaning has been constructions constructed. So how to move from the layers, and this is for me like major, major critical position, how to get rid of all the layers of reading that we have been uh, introduced to throughout uh, history, and to go to the text as text, as language. And from there, live and build and see the different layers. So first look at the language. First look at the different tools that we have, a literary and linguistic tool in order to go to the um, more, uh, 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 to the depths of context and other narratives. So sacred language, we want to remember that this is a sacred language. How at the same time that I'm saying fear and trembling, we want also not to over romanticize and glorify it. So this is very complex. We have both, it's, it's sacred and we want to acknowledge that this is how people used it. But at the same time, what does it mean not to romanticize it, not to glorify it, not to bring nostalgia into it and, and to, to look at it as language in order to build a, 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 the construct of meaning? How to think the, about the authority of the Bible? Can we be critical? To what extent? How far do we go with our critique? And I'm not reading the Bible as a religious person. I'm reading it as a feminist. So I want to bring my critical perspective. I want, but I want to ask how far I can go with it and what does it mean and what does it do to the text? 
to be aware of the blinding spot of sacred narrative, their power over us, the potential to inflict violence, the potential to make us less worthy in the text, especially for women. And I'm going to quote another friend, a friend of mine, Derrida is not a friend of mine, but, but Gila Nijar, who say that yet sacred language cannot be faced for one is either blind to its power and violence or one falls into its threatening abysses. So sacred language has its own power, its authority, it's fantastic. The narratives are so powerful. And at the same time, we want to still be, bring our possibilities and faculties and critical uh, 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 um, uh, tools in order to, um, to, 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 um, to, uh, in order to think about it. And I want to say that here, when I talk about to be included, what does it mean to uh, join the community and be included? I'm talking about how to be included in the text. If women were expelled or ex excluded throughout history from the practice of reading textual biblical, biblical. texts, And women in the Bible have a specific position, how to be included, meaning to how to start to have dialogue with the text and to find a place in which we, as women, are able to connect, to find a space or a spot, sites of identification, sites of meaning that relate to our body, to our experience, to our history as women. How do we do that? And to think about it in a dialogue with the text, to enter to relationship in the text, the with the text, with the narrative language and images. So I'm thinking about a community when I talk about the challenge, but I'm talking about a community that is uh, a, a open to the relationship that we form in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Professor, okay. Papa, sorry for the interruption, but would you please move your casa onto the screen? I think people are having a hard time being able to, to see the, the screen. And um, if you wanted to, are you ready to advance to your next screen? Or yes. Not? Okay. yes. I think they're having difficulty seeing the screen. So if you could just put your casa closer to the screen. I think that was the request I got. How is it now? My cursor is on. So Professor Ruth, your, the slide that we're seeing is the introduction slide. Oh. So we, as you talk, you need to click on the second and third uh, screen that you need, that you want to talk about. As How you is go. it now? It's still the first uh, slide for us. Can you move your cursor and click on the second slide for us? and see what happens. My cursor is on, you know what? Okay. Um, let me see. How is it now? I think it's still there, yeah. It's not, it's it, not giving you? It's not advancing. Oh. Let me turn it off and on again. Yes, you've gotten some advice from fellow teachers that say it might be helpful to stop the presentation and then restart it. This does happen occasionally to some teachers. Thank you everyone for being so patient with the um, technical challenge. But we appreciate your enthusiasm and your attention and lots of sympathy. <laughs> now I can see the faces. Yes, definitely. Okay, how is it now? How is it? How is it? Yeah. Do you see this, this, the methodological consideration? Yes, it seems like people are saying yes, Professor Sofa. Okay, okay. 
Thank you for your feedback. Um, so how to do it? So in many ways, before we're talking about what, how is it now? It looks good. We're on methodological considerations okay, great, right now. Great. So the question of how is as important as what? What do we study? We know it always has been this incredible text, but how to, uh, to think about it? What are the methodological framework and that will help us uh, uh, in the process? So one of the uh, focus is that focuses that we want to, and I'm just reading now from the slide is how has culture read the narratives concerning women in the Bible, their birth, names, body, beauty, and insult? How could we read them otherwise today? Take into consideration issues of gender, feminism, race, ethnicity, and class. The second uh, uh, consideration is Feminist reading of women in the Bible requires us to come with an interdisciplinary approach within the broadest critical perspective. We ask how can we rethink our idea of this narrative? What kind of alternative tools, sensibilities, and knowledge we need in order to enter the women communities of the Bible? So this, this is very important, the idea of rethinking. And what does it mean to come with new eyes, with new possibilities to look at the text? And that takes a lot of training because it's very easy, <clears throat> excuse me, to fall back into the convention in which, as I said, we grew up with, with certain kind of ideas. Who is Eve? What is sin? Especially if we go from one Bible to the other, what is gender, right? Even the idea of gender is already there very clearly. So what kind of old convention we must leave behind? What does not work and how to unlearn these conventions? Many, many things that we're doing, most of my teaching in the last few years is, is, is in fact to unlearn all kind of ideas when it comes to racism, when it comes to colonialism. How do we undo, unlearn different kind of ideas that are circulated in the culture as not only as truth, but as the ax axioms of culture, as the ultimate truth? How do we dismantle these ideas of truth and start to rethink them and challenge them? Because very often they work against us. So close reading, paying attention to language, as I said, syntax, the literary device, how the text is built, identifying puzzling issues and formulating questions. Why this verb repeat? And I'll give example that why the text uses this verb so much? Why is it so, um, why the eyes of Leah as opposed to Rachel that is so beautiful, why her eyes are weak? What does it mean? soft or weak eyes? And what does it say about Jacob's inability to love her, right, when she's described like that? So discussion, discussing works by prominent feminist scholar who have illustrated the field of biblical studies. So going to the text, we read it, we read it as, in, in the, as I said, in the bare, more abstracted way and concrete, and then we see what other feminist, uh, leading feminists have already established in this field. So question of economy and extent are very common. And I'll give an example. The, the story of Adam is Eve, and Eve is so amazing in its contribution and kind of being foundational narrative to our understanding of male, female sexuality, reproduction, uh, female body. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story about the, 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 the human of, 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 of our human and, and humanity. At the same time, this is where gender is squarely put together, male and female. There, is no, there are no other options, but also the construction of gender is very clear because it's hierarchical. Man is uh, on top, women is below, and there is a clear sense that this is how culture and Eve and the uh, eating of the apple 
or the foot is very much associated with her disobedience. Disobedience, inability to follow, inability to fall into the, 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 the male uh, domain. And Helen Sixus, for example, takes this question of uh, the, 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 the sin of uh, reaching her, her hand to the tree and uh, not only eating, but uh, 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 send, uh, 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 handling it to Adam as a, a sight of uh, the desire of woman. And if to think about it, we're talking about economies like the most desirous woman, the woman desirous, no, the one who desire, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, has to do with food, but food is never only food, food is also knowledge and the tree of knowledge and the free. So what does it mean that women are not willing to stop at the idea that they cannot have knowledge and what this quest of knowledge does to Eve, if we rethink really about Eve and Adam and Eve from that perspective and how to think about the woman in culture and the construction of gender as someone who uh, uh, to move away from the construction of gender and think about women as the, 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 the um, epitome on Eve uh, for drive and insatiated uh, appetite for knowing and for curiosity and for creative spirit and going from the libidinal economy, from the libido, not from the super ego and being able to uh, act on her own uh, uh, deeper drives. These <clears throat> transform the scene of Adam and Eve. Um, another approach besides the idea of economy, how much, we can also ask how much do we want to laugh when we hear uh, uh, Sarai, uh, bless you, Sarai's uh, um, laughter, when, when she laughs in the tent, how far can we imitate this laughter? What is the laughter that God heard? in Genesis when the, the angel come and tell, and she hears in the tent that she's going to be a mother and she's like post menopausal and Adam is more than hundred years old. How is it possible? Can we imitate the laughter? Can we stay with the laughter as an affect of the body? What the, can, can, so much is being talked about Abraham as the, the father with the presence to tell God here I am, Hineni. Can we say that Sarah is saying Hineni through her laughter? She's being there and she's aware of time and her body is aware of time. So a question of the economy uh, of, the, of, uh, of an extent of women's desire and women uh, deeper drives can, can bring so much more to the text than just reading that Sarah laughed. What does it mean that she laughed? Other scholars, and just giving two examples, is the reclaiming and filling gaps in the narrative about, that, that mention few, provide few, little information, but don't really elaborate on it and don't take the position of the woman fully. And one example in Jewish tradition is the, the position of Miriam in the fem among uh, feminist Jews and how to reclaim Miriam's voice of crossing the sea. The Bible in Exodus say that she uh, gathered the people with the uh, timber uh, uh, and, and they danced together and she led the people in dancing and they give the two lines of it. So there's music that is being composed to it. Miriam is now being presented on the seder uh, of the Passover ceremony in, uh, with the apple, she's associated with water and the life of water. So her Miriam, the sister of Moses that kind of shadowed under uh, uh, her brother Aaron and Moses, her brothers uh, become a full prophet with full voice that can lead women and can continuously lead women in our culture. So oh, that's that's a thought. excuse the interruption, but um, would you mind uh, advancing your slide so that we can um, 
see what you're talking about? I'm here. I'm in the second. Oh. Are you in methodological considerations? Yeah. I'm here and I'm going to the explore way of these biblical protagonists have figured in modern theistic tradition in art, films, and poetry. So okay. from scholarship, we're going to go to see how these narratives are being- So houses, yeah. there, watch them. Is that connected to this talk? No, I think not. I think I, we want to make sure that everyone's um, mics are muted. Now that's, that is an intervention. So if everyone could make sure please that your mics are muted and um, so that Professor Safar has no interruptions. Apologies, Professor Safar, please go ahead. So, and, and so, so how to go to film, art, poetry, and to think about this narrative and what other uh, writers that struggled with him, an artist, what did they do with this? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's really the scope is immense. One example is a, a, a Rachel and Leah and women and reproduction in Atwood's a dystopian narrative, The Handman's Tale, and the adaptation of the Hulu series and the incredible impact that it has in the culture and how st st so uh, clearly she's relying on the narrative of Rachel and Leah in uh, Genesis. So I'm going to give you, this is like very, um, very limited, but just to give you a sense very clear sense on the, uh, the, the general approach to be women in the Bible. There is so much one more to say and direction to take. I want to give you a clearer example. And I will use for that uh, the, the narrative of Sarah and Hagar. And this is a painting of Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael that actually it's my brother, Sefer Nehushtan who painted it and I included in my book. So I wanted to- well, uh, We can only see methodological uh, considerations. So I'm hoping that we can get a chance to see the painting. How is so, it now? I think your car, no, we can see the castle on the left-hand side, Professor Sofar, it's on number five. No. I think the, the slideshow, it, can she click on, here's some wonderful advice. Can she click on presenter view to toggle it off? How is it now? No, it's not working. Um, hmm. So I think, let me think. It's fine. I'm just going to show the slides without. How is it now? Yes, we can see. It says, yes. Okay. Ishmael. Yes. Thank okay. you. It moved. Yay. Cool. Okay. So, so this is the, the, and I'm going to go to the directly to the narrative and just to show you just how I analyze it. So one, one aspect of feminism with one specific concept, I call it the war of gays. It's a fascinating uh, a narrative, go to Genesis 16, read it. And I have it here, Sarah is after 10 years, has this genius idea to send Abraham to her Egyptian, a slave girl, Hagar, so he will conceive. Her idea, her inner thought, and the Bible is really gives us a, a certain kind of picture of subjective uh, 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 interiority of Sarah when she say, uh, God behold now, that what she said to her husband, Abraham, behold now the Lord has restrained me from bearing, go in, I pray thee unto my handmaid, it may be that I shall be builded up through her. The Hebrews say, Ulai ibane mimena. Ibane is I will be built through her. I will be built through her, that's her subjunctive, that the, the idea, maybe I will be. But ibane in Hebrew is also has the word, the root of ben, son. So maybe I will be sunned in the sense of becoming a mother through her. So there is incredible 
project here for reproduction with Abraham, who is promised to be the father of nations, etc. And here is finally, after 10 years, remember in unorthodox, if you seen it, it's only two weeks after the mother-in-law is coming and ask uh, uh, Esti to what's wrong with her, why she's not getting pregnant. She runs away. You should see this, the show. It's amazing at Netflix. Here, 10 years. So I call it a, a genius. And, um, and, and Adam and Abraham is very obedient, right? He heard uh, Sarah, he, he, he follows, and then very active verb, and she took, Sarah took uh, the woman, Hagar, the Egyptian, and um, she gave her to Abraham for as a, as a wife, as a wife, as a second wife, as a substitute, as a surrogate mother, etc. And it's very short. And he came to Hagar, and he went into Hagar, and she conceived. Bam, she's pregnant. So see how economic is the text. And she saw that she had conceived. Her mistress was despised in her eyes. So when she saw, and, and, and it's not clear who is this she, but we know that it's Sarah that she, another she, it's Hagar. So when she, Sarah, saw that she, Hagar, had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. In the Hebrew it says, and her mistress, Sarah, was lightened, lightened or uh, 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 belittled with her. And this, is, this was for me the beginning of when I'm starting to see that there is something with eyes, something with eyes in the narrative. And um, here we see, um, okay, so here she see, and she, uh, uh, she was, um, and here we go, and she comes to Abraham angry and she say, my wrong is upon you. It's like in Hebrew, it's very strong. Word chamsi. And I gave you da da da. And she saw that she had conceived. I was despised and I will, I was lightened. I was a, 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 in, her, in her eyes. Again, the eyes, God will uh, judge between us. And Abraham is telling her, oh, uh, uh, do whatever good, do to her that which is good in thine eyes, again, in your eyes. And that's, again, the text is very short. And Sarai dealt harshly with her. And in Hebrew, it says, Vate'aneha Sarah. This is one verb, Vate'aneha. And she tortured her. And Hagar runs away. So torture is violence. Torture is violence, violence that is enough to send someone to the desert. I'm not going to talk about the, the torture and the violence of this verb and how uh, this violence has produced the other, the other Ishmael, the other of Judaism, of the, the, the Israelite people and everything associated with the Ishmael in, uh, 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 in, 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 in the uh, Jewish imagination. I want to go from here to a concept in feminism that called the male gaze. Um, let me see. Uh, does anyone know, want to say, I'm going to stop the sharing for a second. I wonder if anyone wants to mention what, what is the male gaze? What do you know about the male gaze? You're soliciting a definition, isn't that right, Professor Tofar? Excuse me? Like a definition from the audience, yes? Yes. Perfect, thank you for that. And Any I cannot ideas? see the chat, so I'm inviting you to unmute yourself and just say some, some things that we can start from there. Okay. Any, I, any um, suggestions for the male gaze as a definition of the concept? Oh, we the have, we expression have used- Expression of desire. An expression of desire. Um, I'm actually taking a woman in films class this semester, so we talked about this, is when we present the female in a way for the male, only for the male to desire. 
Perfect. Uh, if I may, uh, my name is Samuel Branch, and a way of putting it more simplistically for me, um, a, a man looking upon a woman in a lustful way. Yes. And this, I'm going back to my screen. This lustful way has constituted throughout history in its development a, 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 a women's a, a, a perception of how she would be, how she should look, how she should behave, what is beauty, and all of the question of a, a womenhood, very, very important part of gender. So this is just a Google definition that I took and some images. In feminist theory, the male gaze is the act of de depicting women and the world in the visual arts and in literature from a masculine heterosexual perspective that presents and represents women as sexual object for the pleasure, uh, for the pleasure of the heterosexual male viewer. So I will talk about it more. I, what I did in my work, I took the male gaze and I built on it and talked about when it came to eyes and to the way that uh, Hagar looks at Sarah, I start talking about the pregnancy gaze. The pregnancy gaze in Genesis is the descendant of the male gaze, is offshoot, is kind of the offspring of it, embedded in the content of ethos of reproduction and fertility in the ethos of uh, uh, Genesis. It can potentially be inflicted between two women, co-wives, sister, sister-in-law, and in any polygamous household or any extended kinship system from one pregnant woman to any other woman, woman, especially to the barren one. So the pregnancy gaze carries all the content and all the schema of, a, a, of the male gaze and a patriarchy. So patriarchy is an institution uh, uh, provided uh, women throughout and still uh, 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 the, the, the guidelines of being, how to be, how to uh, interact, how to connect with a uh, male as part of gender and the scripted aspect of gender. Gender is scripted, but uh, the, the, the gaze is very much, and we're talking about not only the male gaze, but there's another concept, this guy, to, to be looked atness. To be looked atness, it sounds very awkward. It's the way that we internalize that the word is looking at us. How, how we see ourselves being seen by the word. And the, 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 that is very much saturated with the, the, the eye that we uh, experience as the eye of the word the I-E-Y-I, E-Y-E, -E, as, as a way that we are all, always being seen in a certain consistent way based on the performance of gender, our performance, our way of being, of we inter that we internalize being seen in this public space. And this is built on many other aspects in, 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 in Genesis already, that first God is the one who is the omnipotent, the, 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 the able to see and, and, and in every place and can reach to the heart of one being. We see it in Cain's story, we see it in Adam's story, a kind of, where are you? I can see, I heard the blood, right? In the earth, and the the, the 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 fact that God is God gaze is the one that constitute our relationship, the subjective and collective relationship to God. It's very much very prominent in the culture. From there to go to the male and to see how there is a linear connection, how the male gaze constitutes women's subjectivity and women's interior self. And the idea of the male gaze, we can, we can take it further. We can say how the male gaze can divide, can empower, it's like a weapon, and how it has been, um, uh, uh, how it has been mobilized throughout culture, through Hollywood. And this is when I 
show here, the camera, the, who is behind the camera, who is the choreographer of culture, who is on the stage, who tells women how to dress, what to do on the stage, in the film industry, but also in the, 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 the outlook of culture in much broader way. Samuel Brandt, you have a question? Yes, I believe he does. Um, Mr. Branch, would you like to ask your question in chat or voice it? I, I'm sorry for interrupting, but you brought up something that that just jumped out at me, and I and I didn't and and I I, I want to say it, and, and and I hope you have the answer. Um, yes, I, I would normally put it in chat, but not to hold you up. Is um, the verses that you showed? Um, are we seeing the first evidence of maybe taboo and maybe possibly the the first um, affair? um that was ever recorded um that has transcended throughout history between women um looking at the situation with abraham and uh, abram and sarah and the handmaiden is that would that be considered as the first historical recorded um evidence of 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 of, of a taboo um and where um, I guess would be none. Um, it, it, I, well, I, I, taboo um, in general, and 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 looking at the first known affair. Okay, even though it was condoned, but later regretted. Um, mm. I, I I I cannot say first because we talk about the, the first taboo is the taboo of the eating of the tree of knowledge, of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So uh, this is the first taboo. But, and, and I'm not, I'm talking about the affair between women as a, as a, a competition about, um, competition about the body, the reproductive body. When a woman after 10 years of not being able to give birth, and get pregnant is disabled actually. She's like excluded and uh, not part of the conversation. If the conversation of Genesis is about constituting and instituting different institution of relationship between God and man, God, uh, man and woman, man and land and nations, uh, different institutions, this is not working. The reproductive part is not working. How do you create father of nation when his a, a, a wife, the person who, who is supposed uh, to lead this uh, uh, reproductive chain is uh, burn and he's becoming too old? How do we do it? So, so this is the, from, a, a, from a realistic position. Of course, we can say this is the Bible and there's miracles and all, there are miracles, but I'm trying to look at it from the perspective of how women negotiate power and how this power of reproduction of the body is becoming really aspect of a, a small war between Hagar and Sarah to make Sarah uh, invisible, to make her small, to make her light, the more, the heavier, the body of Hagar becomes, the bigger, the lighter Sarah is, and she feels it. She, she feels it as an assault. She feels it as an insult, a deep insult that is so, actually so damaging that she's willing to destroy, to dismantle her plan. And Hagar leaves and uh, uh, th there is no future, there is no possibility for offspring. She tortured her, and we don't know what torturing here is, but in the Bible, torturing can be sexual, like in Shechem and Dina. It can be whatever it is, it's a deep, violent lesson to teach someone a lesson that will not be forgotten. Let's say this is what to torture is, is to, 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 to create to, to suffering for the sake of suffering. To teach the body what suffering is all about, that's torture. And Sarah is willing to do it. So we have to assume that if Sarah, the incredible 
figure is doing it that the, to, to understand the depth, the, the idea of the torture is to understand the depth of her uh, 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 insult. What does it mean to be invisible? What does it mean to be suddenly going from being the master, the, the one who has the, the slave girl into the one who is actually experiencing, what does it mean to go below and to reverse this hierarchy of women? And this is because thanks or uh, 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 derived from this idea of pregnancy. So I put it all in this concept of the pregnancy gaze as a way it's like what a look can do and how destructive it can be and how it can unfold all kind of other uh, damages in the plot narrative. So I want to stop here. I, there's a lot that I can say. I want to go to, um, to the classroom and I want, I mean, the story is amazing because when she goes to the desert, the angel say, Agar, what's happening? He hears her crying and she say, look, I was been, I has been, have been tortured and say, go back and let her torture you again. You'll become a mother of nation. Your son will be Ishmael, etc., etc." So she's going back, but um, her son will not be the son that, uh, Hagar, that Sarah was uh, conceiving in her mind that will be the one through which she will be built and or be sand. Um, go to the ch chapter, it's, uh, it's amazing. I want to go to the classroom and just, this was just an example. I want to, sh to shortly just say what we do with biblical narrative in the classroom that can, especially for women, especially for young women, but how to extend and how to bring more. So the subject is tied to my richer. I develop strategies for inclusion, how to include more, how to see more in these spaces, how to maximize the teaching events associated with this narrative, asking how to slowly give the student the tools they need to refine the question they ask and take charge uh, and take charge of the interpretive and critical process. How to be your own interpret, in, interpreter or commentator of the Bible with, with humble, without arrogance, but with, with, with real questions. Why, why does she send her? Why does she torture her? What is torture between women? What is pregnancy? Like going back to the deep, the, the, the basic question. In addition, in addition to the exposure, to a wide range of course material, different activities are really critical. How to uh, create the classroom into a place, to make classroom into a place where the text is being performed and enacted in, in this alternative new way. Uh, every student participates in these activities and I'm giving some example. So uh, in presentation and class discussion. So, I give 55 depiction of Eve and uh, in the creation story uh, in a PowerPoint presentation, the student have to choose one and to go deep and analyze it and find new thing to see there, new colors, shades, a, a body posture to look at it in, to see if they can find and look at it in a new way. Um, all student participate in an art review, okay. And, and uh, choosing one, I, I instead of midterm, I like to give symposium. For example, how to undo patriarchy. How uh, going back to a, a very basic foundational narrative, allowing students the opportunity to grapple with the question of patriarchy from then till now, and it's way of changing, like the way of Atwood, right? In The Handmaid Tale, encouraging originality, rhetoric and humor, but also being very close to text. So the text is always the guide coming from the text out rather than coming from outside and say, oh, I think this is about something, right? No, what the text says and coming out. Um, so I do a panel discussion on Mary Magdalene and let students be the judges and let them be the one who bring information and different evidence about 
who is Mary Magdalene, what is sexuality there, what is following, what is witnessing. <coughs> and the semester I concluded with a, a conference of a, or talk, a TED talk about the student final paper. I will stop here if we have a few questions or- Yes, we do. Thank you so much. I'm just going to dive right into them if you wouldn't mind. Some of them are in the chat. I'll begin with this one from Anthony. Anthony says, your point about the eye in the male gaze, it seems to interest him. Is this, do you think, he wonders, at the root of Jesus's teaching against adultery? Referring to if your eye offends of his teaching, if the eye is light or dark. He's wondering if you think there's a relationship between the two. Um, this is Anthony. Yes, yes. I, Anthony wants to know. Yeah. I'm going to invite you to go to the New Testament and explore and study it and see on your own. What do you see when it comes to eye and seeing and how seeing constitute knowledge and community and witnessing? I think witnessing in the New Testament is very, very important. Who witnessed who and who has the authority to claim any kind of a, a evidence based on the eye, on being there, on seeing. More than that, I will not get into it, and I'm not an authority in Jesus, but uh, I on Jesus, but I I would in, invite you to explore and develop these ideas further. That's fantastic. Here's another comment from Wanda. Wanda's wondering maybe this your reference to Sarai and, and Hagar was the first documentation of what sisterhood should never look like. Uh, yeah, it's a failed sisterhood. That's definitely a, 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 a good point. Um, yeah, but 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 the potential for sisterhood was so much there. This is why it's so upsetting. This the potential for incredible connection, but it's not there. Maybe we'll have to look for it in uh, uh, Rebecca and Bilha and some other women who used further later uh, in Jacob's story, uh, uh, the, the, the slave girl as uh, the uh, sister mother, uh, uh, but not here, definitely. This is a big split. This is where, when I talk about otherness, I'm talking about, and the otherness of Ishmael, I'm talking about the core of the, 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 the origin of violence in the Bible. I mean, right. see in Cain and Abel and the brotherhood there, how brotherhood is being uh, de uh, destroyed uh, totally. And now with Hagar and Sarah, but Hagar and Sarah lead to the creation of nations. And we see the reverberation of it today in uh, the Middle East and in the idea, the way people project identity on others based on these narratives and how this narrative impacted the consciousness and the imagination of, of nations and, 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 and nation today in, in our time. Very relatedly, Professor Tsofar, Kasiana poses the question, the invitation, can we research the word torture? how it was used 2,500 years ago and in different contexts. So torture in Hebrew is la'anot, is like an answer, the same root to answer, ana, is to also, it's like, what is the question that deserves such an answer if to torture is an answer? And I, I, the, it, there are many books and studies about torturing, but also in the Bible to torture, uh, we find it a, 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 a very sexual. And when, when we see um, that Shem, a, 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 a see Dina, the, the very, very young virgin woman who goes out to see the, the daughters of the land in uh, later in Genesis 34. And um, he sees her, he, um, he, he saw her, again, eyes. She wants to see the other daughter. He sees her and he um, clings to her, he loved, he, he 
there are several verbs, he lay down with her and he tortured her. So the verb in Hebrew is tortured, and then he loves her. Mr. Untouchable, the prince, loves her after he tortured her. So we want to explore, of course, this is a place where the text is inviting us to, yeah, what is it that he loved her after and his soul clung to her? This is a very problematic narrative, very violent. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so, so how to think about torture? I totally agree with you. This is like a whole uh, uh, web of, uh, 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 and, and the economy, how bad is the torture on the body? What, what aspect of the body, what the, 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 what the, the skin, how the, the, the body resists torture in this period and how we see it in Ishmael. For me, the torture makes Ishmael so detached and unable to connect that his hand in, in everyone and the hand of everyone in him create a system that cannot be uh, in, in, in a, a set that is constantly in a, a turmoil. And that's Ishmael, the, 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 the trauma of the body and how it impacts uh, his relation. Go to my book, I, I analyze it, it's chapter two. Yeah. It's very much- I'm sure to share that, Professor Tsofar, and there's been a lot of interest in your slides. So when you're ready, if you could share them, I'd love to send them out to the teachers next week. I do have a question for you from Jacqueline. Jacqueline asks, is it true that the original language of the Old Testament uses feminine pronouns for the Holy Spirit? Um, the whole <clears throat> I have to see it. I, I cannot talk about um, the pronoun it's true that Hebrew distinguishes between pronouns and there is a very clear masculine and feminine pronouns for uh, uh, in language, but uh, I, the, the Holy Spirit in Hebrew is a Shechina. The Shechina herself is not in the Bible. It's implicated or interpreted as the Holy Spirit. So it's a whole area that is more uh, that is not grounded in the text, or if it is, it's open to interpretation, and I will leave it at, at, at this place. Thank you so much, Professor Tafar. We are um, really out of time. We thank you so much for your thank wonderfully you productive and also fascinating um, presentation. We'd love to invite you back. Please, um, when you're ready, I want to reiterate because there's been so much interest in your presentation. I will surely send the titles of your book. Lots of help, thank yous in the chat. Um, everyone is very, very grateful and happy that you've joined us this morning. Thank, thank you so much. Yes. It's a privilege to talk about this subject, Trima. Thank you again. Thank you all of you for your interest and for your good question and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, Professor Safar. Have a wonderful Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Kristen Waterbury. When she's ready, we're going to um, move on. Yeah, I think we're ready to get started. Um, thank you, Rima. Um, I'll give every give everything a minute to settle here. Um, I see that Professor Cole is here as well. All right. Well, welcome everyone to Mary and Islam with Professor Juan Cole. Um, Juan Cole is the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. Um, his books include, and pardon my Arabic pronunciation, The Rabayat of Omar Khayyam, A New Translation from the Persian, Muhammad, Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of Empires, and the New Arabs, How the Millennial Generation is Changing the Middle East. Um, he has appeared widely on media and is proprietor of the Informed Comment, a news and analysis site. Professor Cole, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. I am having uh, technical difficulties and okay. I cannot share my PowerPoint myself. I sent it to Rima. Yeah, I have it um, and I will I will pull it up for you. And if you want to, I can just click through at, you know, if you want to give me a prompt when you're ready yes. to move to the next slide. 
That, that's how we used to do it in the old days when we had physical slides. We'd say, next slide, please. Sure. Hey, give me one moment to, to get my screen sharing going here, and uh, we can get started. Hold on one second. We are going down history lane, Professor Cole, so this is very apropos. Let me, let me turn it on to present mode. Um, can everybody see everything okay? There we go. Are we good now? Yes, thank you, Kristen. Yes, we can see. Yeah, go, go ahead, Professor Cole, whenever you're ready. Okay, that's great. So uh, let's have the next slide. Yeah, so um, we're talking about Mary, uh, Mother Mary in Islam. A lot of Christians are surprised to discover uh, that uh, they're actually more verses about her in the Quran than there are in the New Testament itself. Um, the, uh, the Quran, as preached by the Prophet Muhammad, uh, roughly 610 to 632 uh, of the Common Era uh, after, after Christ, um, uh, recognizes uh, the truth of Christianity and of Jesus's mission, and says that in the Gospels are uh, guidance and light. Uh, the, the Quran does um, have a different theology than is typical in today's Christianity. Uh, it's not Trinitarian, uh, and um, it um, avoids uh, talk about divinity of Christ, uh, but there had been uh, strains of Christianity that held those positions as well in the late antique era. Uh, and um, so uh, in the period 300 to 700, which historians increasingly call the late antique era, and could, could we have that slide uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the graphic? Yeah. Uh, in that era, which historians now call the late antique era, um, Christianity became dominant in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, the old Roman Empire, uh, after Emperor Constantine uh, backed it. And um, nowadays, with the rise of the university, uh, with uh, uh, the increased authority of, of churches, uh, there's a, a very clear division between uh, kind of authentic uh, scripture and uh, what are called uh, pseudep uh, pseudepigrapha or uh, works that um, represent themselves as scripture, but which are uh, our uh, later uh, compositions and which circulated and were widely accepted in the Christian world after Constantine. So just to give an example, there were infancy gospels, uh, gospels about uh, the infancy and the childhood of, of Christ uh, that were widely accepted by Christians uh, and uh, which were in Greek and Syriac and Arabic. Uh, there was uh, a special emphasis on uh, Mother Mary in, in the e Eastern Church. Uh, and of course, this was at a time before there was, uh, uh, there was the schism between Roman Catholicism and, and the Greek Orthodox Church. But there were monophysites, for instance, other, other forms of, of Christianity. Uh, and there were... Um, uh, there was an emphasis on the Mother Mary. And the Quran rep sort of uh, very much reflects uh, its late antique origins. Uh, and so often its diction uh, is, is startling to contemporary Christians, uh, but uh, resembles uh, much of the Christian literature of its own time. Uh, so can we have the next slide? Uh, Islam grew up in Western Arabia uh, 
in the Hejaz, it's now Saudi Arabia, the, the, the western coast of Saudi Arabia along the Red Sea. And um, uh, Muhammad was born, we think, around 570 uh, to the clan of the Banu Hashim. And what was distinctive about uh, Muhammad and the Banu Hashim, according to the later Muslim accounts, uh, is that uh, they were caretakers of a shrine uh, in the small uh, city of, of Mecca to which people came on pilgrimage for the shrine. The shrine was dedicated to God, uh, to uh, Allah uh, and um, the one God whom, uh, however, <clears throat> there were pagans who worshiped other deities at the shrine alongside God. And the, the Prophet Muhammad was a monotheist, began preaching against uh, uh, this polytheism. Uh, next slide. And um, although he arose in Western Arabia, uh, Western Arabia was a frontier of the Eastern Roman Empire. And Christianity by this time in the early 600s was very widespread. Uh, throughout the empire and into Arabia. So there were Christian communities in Arabia uh, at Najran, for instance, which is now uh, on the, co on the uh, border of Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Uh, and um, uh, uh, th there is increasing archeological evidence of uh, Christianity in Arabia. Huh? We're always glad to have the young audience, uh, but I think we have to mute that one. Um, and so um, uh, in uh, the time that the Prophet Muhammad was, was active, a war broke out uh, between the Eastern Roman Empire and Iran. And there had been many such wars. Iran was the other major power in, in the late antique world, a Sasanian empire in Iran. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of the Quran is addressing this brutal war. During the war, uh, the Sasanian Iranians took the Near East. They took Syria. They took what is now Turkey. They took Palestine uh, and Egypt away from the Eastern Roman Empire. And this was the first time uh, that the Christian areas had fallen into uh, non-Christian hands uh, since the Constantine's uh, Reformation. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the Prophet Muhammad began, uh, according to the Muslim sources, uh, having revelation, uh, revelations around uh, 610. Uh, and uh, there are sayings attributed to him uh, about receiving revelation. He said, uh, according to these sayings, sometimes it comes to me like the tolling of a bell and that is hardest on me. Then it leaves me and I am aware of what he said. And sometimes it appears to me as an angel in the form of a man and addresses me. And then I am conscious of what he says. Uh, and it is, it is said that the first verses of the Quran that the prophet heard in his mind as revelation from the angel Gabriel uh, were recite in the name of your Lord who created, created the human being from a clot recite and your Lord is most generous who taught by the pen, taught human beings what they did not know. Uh, next slide. Professor Cole, just a clarifying question, please. Um, as an audience member wants to know, in the year 570, were people worshiping Allah in Mecca at the Kaaba? Yes, according to the Quran, uh, people were worshiping uh, Allah at the Kaaba. Uh, and um, the Quran complains, however, that they weren't only worshiping Allah at the Kaaba. Uh, from what we can tell, the Kaaba uh, was dedicated uh, to Allah, to, to God. And, and by the way, in, in the Gospels, when Jesus is quoted in his original Aramaic rather than in Greek, uh, he calls God Aloha, uh, Aloho, uh, which is the Aramaic for Allah. So that was uh, the name of God in Semitic languages uh, at that time. 
and you have in Hebrew Elohim uh, from the same root. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, the the pagan Arabs um, <clears throat> were, however, uh, st still worshipped the old gods uh, alongside uh, Allah, and uh, these included uh, f uh, the female deity Allah, uh, the female equivalent of Allah. Uh, whom the Arabs, according to the Quran, uh, had configured as the daughter of, of God, uh, as well as the equivalents of uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of, of, of beauty and love, uh, al Oza, and uh, Alat, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, and, and uh, um, uh, Al Manat who was the goddess of fortune. She's equivalent to Fortuna in, in Roman religion uh, or uh, Tiche in Greek. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, the, the Arabic speakers of uh, Western Arabia and the Transjordan had been living under Greco-Roman rule uh, since 106. And so they identified these goddesses with the Olympians. So there are inscriptions where it's clear that Alat was considered Athena, uh, and Alezo was considered Aphrodite, uh, and uh, Manat was considered uh, to be uh, Tiche or Fortuna. Uh, so the Quran uh, is, is monotheistic. It, it, it preaches just the one God, uh, and a Muslim scripture really resembles uh, sermons or homilies and and psalms uh i taught a course which i used some of the quran in and i i, I told the, the, the some of the students came to me they said they had trouble understanding the quran and i said well you know you can't think about it as a narrative there are narratives in it uh and some biblical narratives the story of joseph is told at some length for instance there are some narratives in it but you have to think about it as mostly like psalms as praises of god uh, and uh, one of them said, but I, I haven't read the Psalms. Uh, so uh, maybe we need to teach Christianity and the Bible first and then, and then on to the Quran. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the Quran seems, <coughs> at least the first half of it, originally seems to have been oral. And there are many signs of oral transmission in it. So it has rhymed prose, so people could memorize it. Uh, and uh, it has a lot of repetition in it uh, because the same sermon, of course, would be preached to different audiences and would get recorded. Uh, and so uh, there are variations in the way the story is told, but there are many kind of stories that are told over and over again in the Quran. Uh, and, and sometimes just elusively because the preacher Muhammad has assumes that they have already heard this once or twice and, and know it. And so he just alludes to it. Uh, but um, it really has to be thought of as sermons or homilies. And, you know, when a preacher preaches uh, uh, and, and uses scripture, often uh, he or she will repurpose uh, stories uh, to make a point. And so there's a lot of repurposing going on in the Quran of, of biblical and also of other uh, extra biblical uh, Christian stories and then of, you know, stories from uh, the Arabian heritage. Um, there was a 19th century missionary trope that the Quran borrowed uh, this material, uh, but it was the inheritance of the people of late antiquity nobody had to borrow it. And the Quran puts it to original purposes to the extent that it, that it, it became the scripture of a fourth of, of humankind. Uh, so it's, it's not just a jumble of borrowings. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna take you through some passages from the chapter of Mary uh, in the Quran, it's chapter 19, and, it, and it, it's, it's the nativity story, the Annunciation and the nativity from the Quran's point of view. So the Quran says, mention Mary in the book when she withdrew from her family to an Eastern location and she drew a curtain against them. Then we sent our spirit to her, which appeared to her as a handsome man. Uh, so the Quran is setting the scene. 
uh, in the in the uh, Sudapocrypha li literature, the uh, uh, Mary is said to have withdrawn to the temple, so she's in a chamber at the Jewish at the second temple, uh, and while she's there, uh, this angel appears to her, uh, and so she's startled. Right? She says, "She said, I take refuge with the All Merciful from you, if you be devout." She doesn't know it's an angel. She thinks that there's a strange man. Uh, next slide. slide. Uh, he replied, I am only a messenger of your Lord so that I might grant you a pure boy. She said, how can I have a boy when no man has touched me and I have not been unchaste? He said, so it is. He continued, your Lord says it is easy for me such that I may make him a sign to the people and a mercy from us. It is a foreordained decree. And then the Quran goes on with the narrative. It says, next slide. So she conceived him and withdrew with him to a remote location. The pangs of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She said, would that I had died before this and had been in utter oblivion. So the Quran, as it tells the story, is staying with Mary during the, uh, during the uh, uh, birth of Jesus and, and talks about her birth pangs. Uh, and um, uh, and, and uh, sets the scene of her uh, holding on to the, uh, uh, the trunk of a palm tree. Now this image is uh, of, of of Mary from of the uh, with the palm tree, is is uh, exists in late antique Christianity, and it it's in uh, the apocryphal gospel, infancy gospel gospel of um, uh, pseudo Matthew. Uh, that's actually probably composed after the Quran, but the Quran and the pseudo Matthew are probably drawing upon. It a story that already existed in, uh, in, in Christianity. Now, I, I apologize, some, some Muslims may uh, uh, be offended by this, but as a historian, I'm bound to say that both the Quranic uh, account of Mary and the palm tree and, and the account in uh, the infancy gospel of Pseudo-Matthew uh, actually are a reworking of a, a, a Greek myth uh, because, um, next slide, uh, in uh, the in the story of um, of uh, Leto, uh, a lover of Zeus, uh, she is chased by the jealous Hera, uh, Zeus's um, uh, main wife, and uh, uh, she because she got pregnant with Zeus, and she goes to the island of De Delos in in the Mediterranean, and uh, escapes from Hera, and there she is able to have. Uh, two two children, Artemis and, and Apollo. Uh, so this um, birth, uh, and 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 she grasps the palm tree as she's giving birth to Apollo. So this this image of giving birth to a god uh, against a palm tree was a a, a commonplace of of uh, uh, Hellenic late antiquity. And it became then incorporated through the folk process into stories about uh, Mother Mary. And, uh, and then that, that then shows up in the uh, Quran. So the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew uh, says, then the child Jesus with a joyful countenance reposing in the bosom of his mother said to the palm, O tree, bend thy branches and refresh my mother with thy fruit. Um, so this this is a trope. This is a, a, a late antique trope. Next slide. So then the Quran goes on, uh, and it has uh, the uh, embryo Jesus speak to Mary uh, from her belly, uh, and and give her solace. Uh, it says, then he called to her from below, "Do not grieve, for your Lord has made a rivulet to flow beneath you. Shake the trump of the palm toward you." and uh, it will drop succulent dates on you. Eat and drink and be consoled. 
If you see anyone say, I have taken a vow, a vow of abstention to the all-merciful and will not speak today with any person. <coughs> so in, in the Quran, the, the, in, the, the embryo Jesus is giving solace to his mother as she's giving birth and uh, is advising her uh, that, uh, that the, the palm tree will supply her with, uh, with uh, succulent dates to assuage her birth pangs and, uh, uh, and, and advises her uh, uh, to avoid human company. So uh, the Quran goes on, next slide. Uh, uh, then having born him, she brought him to her people. They said, Mary, you have done something unheard of. Sister of Aaron, your father was not a wicked man, nor was your mother unchaste. She gestured toward him. They asked, how can we converse with an infant in the cradle? Next slide. He spoke up. So the people accosted her that she's had a, a child out of wedlock. And she said, well, let the child explain. And they said, well, you know, I think children at that age probably talk much. And, uh, and nevertheless, the infant Jesus speaks uh, as a baby. He says, uh, uh, he spoke up, I am the servant of God. He has given me scripture and made me a prophet. He has made me blessed wherever I am and counseled me to pray and give charity as long as I live, and to be dutiful toward my mother, nor did he make me overbearing or rebellious. Peace be upon me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I am raised up alive. Next slide. So then the Quran concludes this vignette of the, uh, of the nativity. It says, that is Jesus, the son of Mary. Uh, the word of truth concerning whom they dispute. It is not fitting for God to sire a child. Exalted is he. When he decrees a matter, he simply says, be, and it is. God is my Lord and your Lord, so adore him. That is the unswerving highway. So what's going on here is uh, the Quran is, is uh, uh, challenging addiction about Christ, that he's the son of God. Uh, I think uh, in a pagan environment that the Quran was being preached in, uh, to say that Jesus was the son of God, um, it was taken literally by the peasants that like Zeus, that God comes down and has sex with women and, ha and, 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 and they bear his children. And I think that image of sonship of God is being contested in the Quran. God is immaterial and, and doesn't sire children. Uh, and it's, it's not fitting to talk about him that way. Uh, and so the Quran avoids this diction of Jesus, the son of God. Uh, it calls him Jesus, the son of Mary, which does have the same implication because <clears throat> obviously if the, God's paternity is somewhere there. Uh, but the mechanism is the divine word. And in that, you know, the Quran is resembling uh, the Gospel of John, which begins by saying that Jesus was God's word. Uh, and the, the Quran is much more comfortable calling Jesus God's word than he is, than it is uh, calling him God's son. Um, and by the way, when I was taught New Testament, and there may be uh, uh, new, new discoveries from Qumran uh, about this by now, but when I was taught the New Testament, uh, my teacher uh, emphasized that uh, Jesus probably didn't refer to himself as the Son of God because in uh, Aramaic and Hebrew, uh, one doesn't use the word God. Uh, the, the Tetragrammaton or Yahweh was, was forbidden, to, uh, forbidden for people to pronounce, uh, and uh, you would use an, a euphemism like heaven. So I was taught that Jesus in the original probably called himself the son of heaven. Uh, and there, there is diction like that in the book of Daniel, for instance, on that it's when the gospels got recast in Greek uh, that, you know, the Greeks were very comfortable with this uh, addiction of the son of God. Uh, and, um, uh, and so the Quran in, in, in this diction may be closer to the original Aramaic of Jesus. Um, 
Uh, next slide. Uh, another issue uh, between the Quran and, and contemporary Christians uh, uh, in Arabia and Transjordan uh, was that there were a lot of here what we would now think of as heresies uh, uh, at the time. And there, there were Gnostics who said that Jesus and Mary were too exalted uh, to actually have physical bodies, that they were kind of specters or ghosts uh, of some sort. Uh, and um, uh, the Quran denounces that way of thinking uh, in, in 575 in the uh, chapter of the table. It says the Christ son of Mary was only a messenger. Messengers before him passed away. His mother was just a woman. Well, I'm sorry, his mother was a just woman. They both ate food. So that, you know, why, why would you have to say they ate food? It's because people, there were people who, who denied it. Uh, and there seems to have been a cult uh, in Transjordan that identified Mary with a lot uh, and um, uh, the, the great goddess and, and, and maybe Jesus with one of the uh, Arabian or Nabataean gods. Uh, and, uh, and the Quran also rebukes them for this. And it says, don't make God, that is the God, God the Father, uh, don't make God the third of three. Uh, in my view, this was uh, rebuking a heresy around Jesus and Mary uh, that would have been recognized as a heresy by the Christians of the time, by the uh, uh, Chalcedonian and Monophysite Christians of the time. Uh, and uh, however, later on, these verses were repurposed in Muslim polemic uh, to, to uh, uh, denounce the Christian idea of the Trinity, which I, I don't think that's exactly what they were about. Next slide. So the long and the short of it is that Mary is a common inheritance of, of, of Muslims and Christians. Uh, and uh, the, the Second Vatican Council uh, in Roman Catholicism in the 1960s recognized uh, the Muslim devotion to Mary uh, and on that grounds used inclusivist uh, uh, theological language to say that Muslims have a part of the truth as Roman, uh, Roman Catholics consider it. Uh, they have a part of the truth in that they believe in, in Jesus, they believe in Mary, maybe they don't do it right from a Catholic point of view, uh, but the devotion, the piety is there, and the, the Second Vatican Council uh, 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 recognized that uh, and praised it uh, and saw it as, as common ground, uh, uh, this devotion to Mary between Catholicism and, um, uh, and Islam. So in popular uh, Islam, uh, shrines grew up to Mary. And often these were shared uh, with, with local Christians because when Islam uh, first arose as an empire, it was, uh, uh, you know, there was a kind of thin Arab Muslim ruling class uh, warriors uh, who had taken over the Southern third of the, of the uh, old Roman empire, as well as the entirety of the Sasanian Iranian empire. Uh, so, but, but for, many centuries, probably the majority of people living in the Muslim empire in the West were Christians. Uh, and so Christians and Muslims cohabited, uh, they knew each other, they interacted. And so at a folk level, uh, you know, th there was a, there's always a process in religions of uh, dedicating space to sacred figures uh, and uh, through relics, uh, uh, you know, objects that are associated with uh, the holy figure. Uh, so um, I once visited a shrine to the Prophet Muhammad in Tunisia uh, that uh, was uh, had as its center uh, uh, the, the hair, uh, hair of the Prophet. It was said that the barber of the Prophet came came west with the armies and. Uh, uh, had, had locks of the prophets here with them. So that became the basis for a whole shrine uh, complex to grow up. Well, similar things happened with Mary in Islam. 
people would say they had a vision of Mary and they would build a shrine to her there. And these shrines often then were resorted to by both Christian and Muslim uh, crowds. Uh, so there, there are many in Egypt uh, shrines to Mary which are ecumenical in this way. There's Mataria in uh, Heliopolis in Cairo, uh, where uh, 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 that, that palm tree that we were talking about is alleged to be. Uh, and, and so people come and visit it. Uh, and um, uh, next slide. Even in uh, today's Middle East, uh, where Christians are still on the order of six to ten percent of, of Egypt, and since Egypt has a hundred million people, that means there are almost as many Christians in Egypt as there are in Greece. Uh, and um, uh, uh, there are still uh, these ecumenical phenomena around Mary. Uh, between Muslims and Christians in today's uh, Egypt. Uh, so uh, there's a, a, a famous Christian preacher who's active nowadays, uh, uh, a, a, a Coptic Christian, and he weaves into his sermons sometimes verses from the Quran. Although he's Christian, his audience is Christian, and he's living in a Muslim-majority society. So he quotes the Quran uh, uh, 342, and when the angel said, Mary, uh, God has chosen you and purified you. He has chosen you above all women. So that's uh, a sentiment that Mary is above all women uh, that, uh, that appeals to this uh, Christian priest and he puts it into his sermons. Um, and then in 2009, uh, you know, there was a, a famous incident uh, that uh, uh, came into the newspapers around the world at the shrine of the Holy uh, Virgin at um, Mostorad in Cairo. Uh, there is a cave and a well. Uh, and um, uh, this is holy to Copts, uh, but Muslim women come to carry away its holy water. And uh, th th that well, the water of it is considered holy because it's, it's at a shrine to Mary. And remember the the Holy Family was said to have escaped uh, Herod by going to Egypt. So Egypt is very plausibly a place where um, there are uh, uh, um, sites associated with Jesus and Mary. And so in folk Islam and, and folk Coptic Christianity, uh, these have grown up. And at the Church of the Virgin and the Archangel Michael in Giza in Egypt, and Giza is where the pyramids are, right? You can see the pyramids usually when you're in, in Giza. Uh, but there's a, a church, and th that picture on the slide is of that church, uh, the Church of the Virgin and the Archangel Michael. Uh, in 2009, uh, there was a collective apparition of the Mother Mary above the church. Uh, and a collective apparition is was, was it was seen by several people at once. Uh, it wasn't just an individual who said, I had a vision of the Mother Mary. It was several people. They said they saw her hoovering over this church in Giza. And, uh, and then crowds flocked to this church. Muslim and Christians both came uh, trying to see her themselves. And there were further such collective apparitions. And there's an anecdote that a journalist told who was there uh, that there was a Muslim young man who came and he was very eager to see the Mother Mary uh, above the church. And the, uh, there was a Coptic Christian girl there. And she said, well, you have to understand not everybody can see her. It depends on how pure your heart is. So there was this dialogue going on among these young people across the religions uh, about this apparition. Next slide. Uh, so, um, uh, there's a form of Muslim spirituality called Sufism, uh, and Mother Mary had a special place in Sufism. So, uh, there was a great Sufi saint, uh, uh, Ibrahim ben Adham, who was known as an ascetic, someone who, who uh, avoided the earthly pleasures, but who also was extreme in his reliance on God. So he wouldn't work for a living. Uh, he, he would just be holy and, and, 
he would get food and, and money uh, one way or another. People would give him things or it would show up uh, because God was taking care of him as the trope. Uh, so uh, one story goes this way. It is narrated that he had some companions who stayed with him for two months and they had nothing to eat. Uh, once Ibrahim came to uh, ask them to enter a garden when they found a tree with peaches on it. So one of the companions was hungry and uh, he filled his container with peaches um, in this garden. So Ibrahim asked him what he had done and he told him, yeah, I, I picked the peaches. So uh, Ibrahim uh, uh, bin Adam then rebukes his companion. Uh, oh, you of little faith, if you were patient enough, you would have seen fresh dates coming to you as Mary received fresh dates. So Mary is being given here as an example of someone who, who, who was taken care of by providence. So remember in the Quran verse, the, the, the embryo of Jesus instructs Mary to shake the palm tree and dates would come down on her uh, during her, her uh, birth pangs. Uh, so she's being given as an example by this Sufi uh, um, uh, ascetic of how you can rely on God to take care of you. He'll take care of you just as he took care of Mary. Um, next slide. Then, uh, especially in Muslim Spain, because you know the southern uh, half of Spain was under Muslim rule uh, from the early 700s uh, until uh, 1492, the same year that Columbus uh, came to the New World, uh, the, the Muslims were finally expelled uh, or made to convert in, uh, in Spain. Uh, so, uh, but in that period, uh, there was a great Western Muslim civilization, again, had Christians among them. Uh, and uh, so Mary uh, was uh, an important figure and there were joint shrines in Spain. Uh, and uh, uh, um, a great scholar, Abu Abdullah al-Qurtabi uh, from Cordoba uh, wrote uh, in the 1200s, um, truly Maryam, uh, that's the Arabic word for Mary, uh, is a prophetess because God inspired her through the angel in the same way that he inspired the rest of the male prophets. So, well, that's an original thought. And he wasn't the only one in Muslim Spain that came to this conclusion. Uh, because, and he's, what, he's, what he's saying is, the prophet Muhammad was said to have received his revelation from an angel. And then angels appear to Abraham and to Moses in the Quran. So angels are very much associated with revelation and with prophecy and, and prophethood. And we saw in the Quran that the angel appeared to Mary in the temple uh, and gave her the news of, of in the Annunciation uh, of, of, of the virgin birth. So uh, he, he's arguing from that, that, that angels appear to prophets, uh, angel appeared to Mary, therefore angel is a prophet, it's a syllogism. Uh, and uh, uh, she's the only woman that I can think of in uh, Islam who some people, not, this was not a universal opinion, some people came to view as a prophet in her own right. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I, of course, she's not viewed in that way by Christianity itself. Uh, so in a way, uh, this Muslim thinker is giving her a higher status uh, than even than she has in Christianity. Next slide, slide please. And then uh, among um, Muslims, uh, both in folk Islam and in spirituality or mysticism and Sufism, uh, people often had dreams of Mary. Uh, and if, uh, uh, Ibn Sirin in the 700s of the Common Era said, if someone sees Mary in his or her dream, surely that person will receive a high position and all his or her needs will be fulfilled. If a woman who is pregnant sees Mary in her dream, she will give birth to a wise child. If she is accused of calumny, she will be free from these accusations and God will show her innocence. Uh, remember, 
this is a Muslim speaking to Muslims. These are Muslim dreams. And, and, and they're dreaming about Mother Mary, uh, and, 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 and it has the significance for them. And so my final point, next slide, uh, is about Shiite Islam. Uh, that's the form of Islam that predominates in Iran and Iraq, Southern Lebanon. Uh, and um, uh, it is about 10% of Muslims uh, who believed that the, the family of the prophet should have succeeded him. After Prophet Muhammad's death, he was succeeded by caliphs, uh, three of whom were uh, not, not blood relations or not close blood relations at least. Uh, and um, the, the Shiites were the ones who felt that Ali, Prophet's uh, co first cousin and his son-in-law, married to the Prophet's daughter, Fatima, should have succeeded the Prophet. And in Shiism, there's this emphasis on the family of the Prophet. Uh, there's the, the five holy souls, Panj Tane Pak in, uh, in Iran, uh, which are the Prophet and Ali. Uh, and, and Fatima, the prophet's daughter, and then uh, Ali and Fatima's two sons, Hassan and Hussein. Um, and in Shiite Islam, Mary and Fatima became closely associated in, in, in uh, folk religion. Uh, both were held to have been free of sin. Uh, and um, uh, there's also a Shiite tradition that when Fatima was born, uh, Mary was uh, one of the spectral figures that attended her birth. Uh, and um, Mary and Fatima thus are very significant, uh, both of them to uh, Shiite Muslims. Uh, it was one of the reasons that uh, some of the Catholic thinkers in Europe became very interested in Shiite Islam because of this special emphasis on Mary uh, in that religion. And both of them had sons, Jesus on the one hand and Hossein on the other, who were persecuted uh, unjustly. So uh, just to sum up, uh, Mary is an important figure in uh, Muslim spirituality. Uh, she has an important place in the Quran itself, an important place in uh, both formal and folk Islam. Uh, and she's been a point of ecumenicism between Christians and Muslims all through history. Uh, she's so important that she's invaded people's uh, dreams and visions uh, throughout the Middle East for uh, 1400 years. And I'll stop there and open for questions. Thank you so much, Professor Cole. We, uh, we appreciate that. I'm gonna, to let me close out the presentation here so I can see everything again. If anybody has any questions that they'd like to uh, ask, I'm not sure if people can unmute themselves or if they wanna put their questions in the chat, um, that would be, um, appreciated. Um, I think uh, Theo has a question. Go ahead, Theo. Yeah, can, can you read me the questions because I'm on my eyes. I will, I, will, I, I will read you the questions if they appear in the chat, but if people unmute themselves and ask, I'll let them address you directly. Okay. Go ahead, Theo. This says the chat's disabled. Yes, exactly. That's what I wanted to mention. The chat is disabled, so we're not able to submit anything in writing at this point. Okay, go ahead. I think it should be working now. Thank you for letting thank you for letting us know. But thank you, Professor Call, for another very informative presentation. You covered a lot of ground for us, so I appreciate that. Would you comment in terms of Mary uh, influencing the development in the Islamic tradition, focusing in terms of women's rights, uh, especially in Sharia, uh, to extent that this time allows. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, I, I because of the very high station that was given to Mary, uh, both in the Quran and in subsequent Muslim uh, thinking. Um, uh, I think she does uh, lend status to women uh, as a figure. And uh, that was one of the uh, startling things about uh, Portobi's assertion uh, that she was even a prophet. Uh, so uh, a lot of Muslim theologians would have said only men can be prophets. 
Uh, but uh, because of this uh, uh, high station of Mary in the Quran, some Muslim theologians even allowed that she might be one. Well, if a woman can be a prophet, then uh, women's status is elevated by that. Uh, so, uh, and I know that in um, uh, contemporary, you know, 20th and, and 21st century feminism, uh, that uh, Muslim uh, feminists have appealed uh, to Mary and her high station in the Quran uh, for support of their position. We have a chat here, a question here in the chat. Um, would you say that the Quran is a continuation of the Bible? Well, um, what I I think that's a theological question, and I'm uh, just a historian. But uh, what I can say is that the Quran thinks that it's a, the, a, a continuation of the Bible. That is how the Quran presents itself. So uh, there are verses in the Quran that sort of catalog the prophets. You have the patriarchs, Abraham and, and uh, Jacob and uh, Israel and, and Isaac and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, Ishmael. Uh, and then you have Moses and, and the, the prophets that succeeded him, the, the, the prophets of the Hebrew Bible uh, in, the, in the period after the patriarchs. Uh, and uh, then you have John the Baptist, which the, the Quran acknowledges. Uh, and, 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 then, uh, and then you have Jesus. Uh, and um, so Muhammad is presented in the Quran uh, as a successor of Jesus uh, and uh, as someone who came to, it says, affirm uh, Jesus' teachings. Uh, and um, uh, that, that the Quran thinks of, of sacred history as, uh, uh, as beset by a kind of entropy. Uh, in the Quran, prophets come and they preach the one God, they preach morality. Uh, and people accept it for a while. Uh, and then after a while, they go back to worshiping multiple gods or they fall into uh, immorality of various sorts. They become debauched. And, uh, uh, and sometimes as with Sodom and Gomorrah, God takes vengeance on them and wipes them out. New people arise. And then new prophets come and try to get them back on the right track. So all of sacred history in the Quran is this kind of message, acceptance, fall from the message, and then renewal of the message, new prophets coming. Uh, so the, the prophet Muhammad is positioned in the Quran as only the latest in, in the succession of prophets uh, with the Quran coming as a successor to the Bible uh, to, um, not to change anything, really. Uh, uh, it, the Quran has a theory that each prophet, major prophet, brings new religious laws and rituals. But with regard to morality, uh, with regard to the basic teachings, to regard to monotheism, uh, the Quran sees itself as a uh, affirmation of the Bible, uh, and 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 the but it, but but it is alleging that. The Jews and the Christians have rather fallen away from the Bible, and so it was necessary for God to speak again. Thank you for that. And I have two questions here regarding the naming of, of some of these. So I'm going to try and condense them a little bit here. Well, the first question is, any connection between the naming of Fatima Portugal and Fatima Ali's wife and the apparition of Mary there, now called Our Lady of Fatima? And then the other question is similar. Is there any connection between the names of Mary, Miriam, and Miriam. Right. Uh, so with regard to Mary, Miriam, and so forth, they're just variations on a theme. Uh, they're all the same. Uh, and um, with regard to uh, 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 Our Lady of Fatima, um, yes, I, I think that was another joint shrine, which is how it came to be called Our Lady of, of Fatima. But I, I don't know the details of that. I think, but I, I think that's fairly easily Googleable. And I also have a question here. Is there any belief or talk of Mary's assumption into heaven as in Christianity? Hmm. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. 
I, I know that, um, the, that there came to be a Muslim belief, although I don't believe it is, uh, it is expressed in the, in the Quran itself in a literal way, but there came to be a Muslim belief uh, in, in um, the sinless birth of Mary, which is also similar to some Christian uh, theology, but um, I don't know about uh, ascension. That's okay. Thank you for, for, for entertaining the question. I do have another comment question here. Um, could Professor Cole comment on the, on the research or publications available regarding sacred, church, uh, sacred structures, mosques converted to churches and vice versa? Sure. How, are depic um, how are depictions of Mary as mural, a mural mosaics viewed as these structures change hands? Um, the Hi. Isopia would be an example. Um, Furthermore, is there research that examines other example, um, other examples of how followers of both religions still utilize these sacred structures, um, building on his example of the shrine of the Holy Virgin in Cairo, shrine of the of Holy Virgin in Cairo? Yeah. Well, I, there's a difference between the, the folk practices at these small shrines, which are often ecumenical and shared in some way. Uh, and the monumental structures like the uh, Hagia Sophia or uh, the uh, Cathedral Mosque in Cordoba, uh, where uh, the, the monumental structures were taken over by the other side, uh, uh, and, and they were often reconfigured uh, in, in very radical ways. So um, the, the great mosque of Cordoba is a church. It's still an active church. Uh, and uh, it's full of uh, Spanish Roman Catholic uh, imagery. Uh, there are uh, paintings and uh, uh, candelabras and and uh, and so forth. Uh, so um, it's it's very much a, a church. And when you're inside it, uh, if you know Moss, the architecture seems awfully familiar. But but then the decor is very Christian. So it, it was claimed by the Reconquista, which was a militant Christian movement, um, very anti-Islam, uh, to put Christianity stamp on this usurper, uh, I think is how it was viewed. Uh, and there are lots of politics around the, the, grand, uh, the, the uh, grand Cathedral, the Cathedral Mosque in, uh, in um, Cordoba. Uh, there are requests. Uh, by the Muslim community in Spain and, and also in the Middle East for the Spanish uh, uh, government uh, to uh, allow it to be turned back into a mosque. Uh, um, I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, or, or, uh, or, 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 or be reconfigured as neutral ground or a museum or, or something that, it, that, that the Christianization of it somehow be reversed. And so far the, the Spanish authorities have resisted these requests. Uh, but in uh, the Hagia Sophia, which was built by Justinian in the uh, 500s, uh, and which was a, a major uh, church in the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, um, uh, that was taken by the Ottoman uh, Muslims in uh, 1453, uh, and they turned it into a mosque. Uh, figural art is disapproved of in, uh, in Muslim architecture mm -hmm. uh, on the grounds that uh, it's, the, it's the same as the Ten Commandments, right? That you, you shouldn't have any graven idols. So Muslim authorities were afraid that if you had images in a mosque of people, that people might worship them. Uh, they might consider them holy and, and, and worship them. And so for a strict monotheism, uh, mosque architecture uh, and, and decoration prefers floral patterns or geometric patterns, uh, there typically aren't human beings uh, being depicted. Uh, there is figural art in the history of Islam. And th those pictures of Mary that I was showing you in my slides were mostly Iranian and, and Indian uh, Mughal miniatures. Uh, and um, uh, so they were done by uh, sometimes Muslim artists or sometimes Hindu or Christian artists for a Muslim court. Uh, and so there was figural art, especially in the East, uh, but, uh, but not in mosques. And so at the Hagia Sophia, my recollection is they put screens in front of the mosaics so that you, you, you couldn't see them while you were worshiping. 
In the early 20th century, uh, there was a secular reformation in Turkey and Kemal Ataturk, uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk uh, made the Hagia Sophia into a museum rather than a mosque. And it wasn't used as a mosque for many, many years, uh, uh, for decades. Uh, but uh, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the current president of Turkey, is uh, kind of a Muslim nationalist. And uh, uh, to please his constituency, uh, he, he just recently turned the Hagia Sophia back into a mosque. Uh, and that caused a great deal of outcry, especially in Greece. Uh, but uh, it seems like a fait accompli. Well, thank you for that answer. It's very interesting. And I, I had just read that the, the Hagia Sophia has gone back and forth um, recently, especially. Um, I'll ask one last question here, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up this session. Um, has Mary impacted um, in other parts of Muslim communities, in, like, for example, in Sub-Sahara Africa and South and Southeast Asia? And in, I know we'll get to Southeast Asia soon uh, in Catholicism and things, but um, I thought I'd let you answer that as well. Sure. Well, I, uh, I don't know so much about those areas and, and so the folk practice is there. Uh, I'm an Egypt historian, but um, I, I would say that everywhere Islam has gone, uh, it's taken these stories uh, of Mary with it uh, and uh, where it coexists with Christian communities uh, in the Philippines or in uh, in Africa, Mary does become a, a point of ecumenism between the two communities. Well, thank you so much, Professor Cole. We, we really appreciate the time. Um, we thank you for your presentation um, and, and your time this morning. I just wanna draw your attention to, I think my colleague Rima has put a survey in the chat of, for attendance. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling that out after each session or at the end of all of the sessions, um, we are also going to take a brief break and resume at exactly 11.15 and when we'll hear from Catholic Mary in Southeast Asia from Professor Deidre de la Cruz. Um, so thank you again, Professor Cole. We appreciate your time this morning um, and your presentation. And uh, we, will, we will resume at 11.15. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>